Well, today we want to look at uh, <clears throat> Romans chapters 2, uh, beginning at verse 17 and going over into chapter 3, verse 8. Remember, the, uh, uh, the chapter and verse divisions were not originally in uh, the scripture. Uh, they were added several hundred years <clears throat> later. So sometimes a thought that begins in one chapter is carried over into another, and this is a good instance of that. Uh, in Romans chapter 2, and beginning at verse 17, Paul says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you're instructed from the law, and if you're sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who, who say one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our righteousness serves to show the right, our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us, saying, their condemnation is just. Uh, human nature is, is given to extremes, and human nature often does not tolerate anything in the middle, uh, because extreme positions uh, don't have any uh, intellectual attention to them. Uh, it's everything, uh, everything is cut and dry, black and white. So when it comes to religion, the extremes are often licentiousness or legalism. Some emphasize the grace of God to such an extent that uh, as uh, one, uh, I remember one young lady in a high school youth group I was in who had uh, heard that uh, if a person is truly a Christian, then God will never let go of that person and that a true Christian can never lose his, her salvation. 
And she said, you know, that uh, doctrine of eternal security has been a great comfort to me because I've just given up trying to be good. <laughs> because I know no matter what I do, God's going to save me anyway. Well, that's ridiculous. That is presuming upon the grace of God. And the other uh, extreme is legalism. To, to think that we have to earn the favor of God and that God loves us because we are obedient. And both of those tendencies are human extremes. Now remember we mentioned last week the, the Amos technique where Amos in his prophecy uh, denounced the sins of those surrounding, uh, those people surrounding Israel and Judah began with those farthest away and then worked himself around the map and talked about all the pagans and then he talked about the those ungodly Yankees in Israel, the northern kingdom, and uh, then he talked about those self-righteous southerners in Judah and he zeroed in on them. Now this is what Paul has done. He's talked about the licentious, immoral, idolatrous Gentiles. Then he talked about the religious moralists, some of whom were Gentiles, but he's really talking about the Jews. And now he addresses the Jews uh, head on and their self-righteousness. When you look at the sermons of Jesus, uh, in fact, I had a lecture on this when I was teaching preaching. It's called The Doors to the Conscience. Uh, the back door, side door, and the front door. Now, Jesus used the side door and the back door most of the time. But he used the front door to the conscience with the Pharisees. A direct assault on the conscience. And his, the most famous of his sermons is the Sermon on the Mount, so, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But his most vigorous sermon, his most scathing denunciation, was preached the la uh, during Holy Week between uh, the triumphal entry and the crucifixion. When he would go into the temple precincts every day and preach, and it's called the Sermon of the Seven Woes. And it's in Matthew chapter 23. It has seven points. And that the, each one begins with this denunciation. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And then he goes on to denounce them. That was his most forceful sermon that he ever preached. It was against pharisaical self-righteousness. Now, when Paul is talking about those who are mired in dead orthodoxy, he's really talking about himself his own past experience. And if you look at Paul's testimony that is, he gives in Philippians chapter 3 and then the many times that it's listed in the book of Acts, he, he talks about his, his own self-righteousness, how he was trying hard and he was very sincere and that he sought to keep the law and that he was very zealous. But the Lord Jesus arrested him by the Spirit on the road to Damascus and transformed and changed his life. So when Paul is talking here about dead orthodoxy, he's talking about himself because he had been saved out of dead orthodoxy himself. Now the gist of this is that basically we need to realize that dead orthodoxy cannot save us. And remember that Paul is using a diatribe here, which is not a denunciation like we usually the term, but it is anticipating objections and speaking to a hypothetical opponent. And that's what he does here. Uh, in the latter part of chapter 2, he dismantles their erroneous ideas uh, and answers their anticipated objections in verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. So really basically, he's given us two reasons why dead or orthodoxy can't say it. First of all, dead orthodoxy is spiritually fatal. It's possible to be very orthodox but lost. James uses the strongest illustration of this that he possibly could in James chapter 2. He said, you believe there's one God. 
you do well. The demons believe and tremble. The most orthodox beings in the universe are demons in the, of hell. They are orthodox in their theology. Uh, that, or, uh, that orthodoxy expresses itself in three different ways. Correct theology, religious rites, and good works. The Jews relied on their observing the law, correct theology, and good works, and the rite of circumcision, a religious rite. The three most frequently quoted creeds in the church are the Apostles' Creed, which we use in worship here, the Nicene Creed, which we use in worship here, and the Athanasian Creed. Uh, I don't think we've ever used it. It's, it's much longer. Uh, but it's used in uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church and uh, Anglican churches uh, and other more liturgical churches, but it begins with this. He who would be saved must believe. And that goes on to give an expanded list of orthodox doctrines longer than the Nicene Creed. Now, it is true that you must believe certain things to be true in order to be saved. But it's also true that you can be very orthodox in holding to something in your mind and not have your heart changed. And that's what Paul is addressing here. Now in doing so, he, he uses eight different phrases to describe the Jews of this day that describe their self, uh, their self confidence. He said, you proudly, call, you proudly call yourselves Jews. Now Paul liked word, word games, plays on words. Uh, we find at least two of them here. One is uh, the, the term Jew. And the other, as we'll see, is faith or faithful, faithfulness, faithlessness, unfaithfulness. The term Jew was, or, or Judah, comes from Judah, which is one of the 12 sons uh, of Jacob, the, the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. Judah means praise. Now, later on, uh, it came to mean uh, the Jew, the term Jew was used of those in the southern kingdom after the Jewish Civil War, when the North rebelled against the South. Uh, and the uh, two southern kingdoms, uh, southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, uh, remained separate and, as a separate nation for uh, a little bit longer than the northern tribe did. But then after they, they uh, returned from the exile, uh, all of the people of Israel were known as the Jews. And Paul is playing uh, on that term and its original meaning, meaning praise. He says, you call yourself a Jew. That is, uh, one who praises, or the one who is praised. And there's an irony here. Remember what Jesus said about the Pharisees? They love the praises of men more than the praise of God. That is, they wanted people to praise them rather than for God uh, to praise them. So uh, they're self-confident because they, they relish in the name of Jew. They relied on the law. Uh, my Greek professor in college was uh, Dr. Glenn Atkins. Uh, he was a brilliant linguist. Uh, I had him for Greek and German. Uh, he was so smart that he would only explain something once. Because once was good enough for him. That's how we picked up languages. He just, you know, he explained it once and, and you've got it. Uh, but I remember his pointing out, not simply because he said it once, but also because it was repeated in the uh, textbook, Anna and Mantis, that's Greek grammar, that 
In, in uh, Greek construction, when you use an article before noun or you don't use an article before noun, it, uh, it has a sp specific meaning. Now, if you don't use the article, it's called an anarthrous construction. It focuses on the meaning of the noun itself. So, Paul doesn't use an article here. He says you rely on law. He's not talking simply about the law, the, uh, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, but the principle of law, the idea of law that somehow with legal obedience you gain standing with God by keeping the moral law, by keeping the civil law, uh, the ceremonial law so assiduously that you're getting points with God. You, you brag about being God's chosen people that uh, we are the chosen ones. Uh, and you, you, de you, you delight in that. Rather than you being humbled by it, you delight in it and you brag about it. Remember what God says, uh, you only have I known of all the nations of the earth about Israel. I did not choose you because you were the greatest nation, the most numerous nation, the most powerful nation. His, his election was solely based upon the grace of God. They uh, claim to have spiritual discernment, that they, they could uh, know exactly what uh, was uh, more, more spiritual than the other. They've been instructed or catechized by the law, the law, the law of Moses. They thought we were, we're spiritual guides, you're guides to the blind. Remember what Jesus said to the, about the Pharisees? He said, you're the blind leading the blind. Uh, you think you know the right way, but you don't. You're leading people to uh, destruction. Uh, you thought yourselves to, because you're a knowledge of law, to be the very embodiment of knowledge and truth. So he uses these phrases to show how how. Silly, it really is how silly self righteousness is, and that's why it is so fatal. Then he raises some questions. He, he raises five rhetorical questions. Now, you can phrase questions in Greek three ways. One is you phrase the question that the expected answer is yes, you can phrase the question the expected answer is no. Or you can phrase the question that the is ambiguous as to whether what answer you expect. Now, when Paul raises rhetorical questions here, he expects them to be answered in a definite way. Now, you who claim to be teachers, do you teach yourself? The expected answer is no. You don't. Because you don't let the truth seep, seep into your heart. Do you steal? Yes, you do. Absolutely you do. Remember, uh, some of the Pharisees uh, said they didn't give because of uh, Corban. Corban means dedicated. So they, they would say they had a, a legal obligation under the law of Moses to care for their aged parents. But they would say, well, you know, uh, the daddy's gone and mother's uh, uh, weak and ill and so forth, but I'd like, I would so much like to help my mother, my aged mother, but I just can't do it because I've made a pledge to the building fund uh, at the temple. Remember that it was a three decade long building project to refurbish the temple. And um, I j I'm sorry, but I just can't do it. Well, they were using that as an excuse to evade uh, their, their responsibility. And of course, they had been robbing from God. Now, uh, as the law of Moses required them to tithe. You who say you shouldn't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Well, of course, the answer is yes, absolutely yes, they do. They do so mentally through lust, remember the Sermon on the Mount, lust is equivalent to adultery. But then some of them actually, truly, in a real sense, Two of the ministers who were recently deposed, both of them were my, uh, of those two, both were my former students of my seminary. 
Uh, one of them, I really wasn't surprised. I wasn't. Because uh, he exuded self-confidence and know-it-all attitude and that rules didn't apply to him and so forth. So when he fell into adultery, I was deeply saddened, but I was not at all surprised. The other, I was surprised. I was shocked. Because he had been such a... Uh, responsible student. He had served as an assistant pastor under two very well-known ministers. Uh, and he was, when you think of the theological spectrum in the PCA, now we don't have any liberals in the PCA who deny the Trinity or the deity of Christ. So uh, we're all recovering fundamentalists. It's just uh, the spectrum of conservatism. Uh, but this fellow was on the right. He was very meticulous about his orthodoxy. But his theology didn't keep him from sin. So you see, it is possible to uh, preach against adultery and then end up doing it. He said, you who abhor idolatry, <clears throat> don't you rob temples? The expected answer is yes, most certainly. Now, there, uh, there is a uh, statement. Josephus was a, a, a historian of the Jews of Jesus' day. And Josephus uh, records in his history of the Jews uh, an embezzlement controversy. They, to become the high priest uh, was a very lucrative position because, remember, the money changers, Jesus twice cleansed the temple of the money changers. They had their own currency, so if you came with uh, Roman money, you had to get it changed into temple money, and there was a surcharge for that. And then they also sold sacrificial animals. So if you're at a distance and you're uh, coming from Alexandria in Egypt or Rome and you're coming to a festival in, in Jerusalem, you're not going to bring the sacrificial animal with you. You buy it on the temple site. And many of them, many of those that were sold were sub-quality animals. So uh, they were, it was, as Jesus said, they, the temple itself was a den of thieves. Now, not only that, there were a number of instances about that time of temple plundering, tem pa plundering pagan temples. So a Jew would not dare think to go to, into a temple for a worship service of a pagan temple, but some of them did go into these pagan temples and steal the idols and sell them. So, Jesus, uh, so Paul is saying, you who, who abhor idolatry, do you rob temples? Yes, you do. Do you honor God? You say you honor God. Do you honor God? No. The Gentiles noted the casuistry of, of uh, Jewish legalism, and they ridiculed the Jews for it. Uh, I grew up in a, on the block. On, there were a number of Orthodox Jews on our block when I grew up in Birmingham. Um, it wasn't until the late 1950s that uh, people in our neighborhood converted from coal-fired stoker furnaces to central uh, heating with gas. But uh, what the Orthodox Jews would do in our neighborhood they would hire one of the goyim, one of the Gentiles, to come in and shovel coal in, uh, into their furnace during the winter on, on the Sabbath. And I really looked forward to that because it would be uh, a teenager that would do it, when it, usually a high school kid. Uh, and wouldn't you know it, the Garbers, who lived right across the street from me, Orthodox Jews, just about the time I got old enough to shovel coal, 
they switched to the gas furnace. <laughs> and so I never got to do it. But the Gentiles noted the casuistry of all of the, of the being sure that they observed all their traditions. When I was in Israel, uh, there was an elevator. It was called the Sabbath elevator. Because it's considered a sin by the Orthodox to walk into an elevator and push a button. <clears throat> so in the hotels, they have Sabbath elevators that are programmed to stop at every floor. So if you're on floor 17, you can get on the Sabbath elevator, step on, but the door closes, it goes up to number two, the door opens, pauses, it goes up to number three, the door opens. Pauses, goes all the way up to 17. And the Gentiles, they didn't have elevators back then, but the Gentiles noticed the Jews are making up all these clever ways of getting around the law. Now, there were, uh, William Barclay in his commentary uh, mentions a number of other reasons why the Gentiles didn't like the Jews. In fact, they hated them. There were a number of false rumors about them. But uh, they had to give uh, money for the paying, uh, supporting the temple, and they would they allowed them. There were laws about transporting current uh, money, but the Jews were exempted if you said this money is going to the temple. So what they do if you lived in Rome and you wanted to to uh, send some money to your uh, uncle Levi who lives in Jerusalem. Uh, you could just give it to the uh, person who was going to take the temple tax money, and he would. And so when he was stopped at a toll booth to pay taxes, he said, "Oh, this money's going to the temple. Okay, all right, that's okay. No tax on that." So then you. It was just a way of avoiding taxes. The Jews were allowed by the Romans to keep the Sabbath. They didn't have to work. So the Romans said, wait a minute, I have to work seven days a week and he gets off every Sabbath? And then all these festivals that they have, they're counted as Sabbaths too. And they get all those extra days off. What about me? Uh, they didn't, uh, they were exempted from being in the military? Wait a minute, you mean my kid's going to be drafted and your, your son isn't? Why? Well, because the Romans had these idolatrous standards, you know, the Roman eagle and so forth. Those were idols. And the Jews said, wait, we can't participate in idolatry. And besides that, we can't fight on the Sabbath. So they got a double exemption. And that caused a, a lot of, a lot of resentment, uh, resentment. And then uh, Every year, every woman citizen had to offer incense to the, uh, in honor of the emperor and say, Caesar is Lord. By that they meant not simply Caesar is the emperor and the head of this political empire, but they were saying Caesar is a god. But the Jews were exempted from that. Remember when we were studying Hebrews, that was one of the temptations for the Jewish Christians who came, who had called, who had trusted Christ, to revert back to Judaism, so that they uh, they would not be persecuted. Now, <clears throat> the Jews also elevated the right of circumcision to be a guarantee of salvation. That there, 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 there's a constant human temptation to substitute ex external rights for internal spiritual reality. Circumcision was instituted in the days of uh, Abraham as a, as a covenant sign to be administered in, at the age of eight days to every male child. And then every convert, adult convert, was also circumcised. Now, uh, the Jews weren't the only ones who practiced this right. The Egyptians did. And there are many cultures today but it's regarded as a rite of passage from puberty to adulthood. Uh, it's also practiced in Islam, uh, but also at puberty. And when the, when the Jewish, when the Islamic conquest took place, 
uh, over a period of about 700 years, which wiped out many Christian communities. Uh, men were given a choice. Uh, you either go under the knife, be circumcised, and become uh, a Muslim, or you get the sword. We're going to kill you. All right. What do you choose? So that's, that's how you had many forced conversions. But this uh, circumcision amongst the Jews was a, a sign of inclusion into the uh, covenant community. But the scriptures speak of the circumcision of the heart to emphasize that God's covenant must permeate one's entire life and not just be uh, an external right. Remember when Jesus was talking with Nicodemus in John chapter 3? And he said, you must be born again. Nicodemus didn't have a clue. And Jesus said to him, you are a master of Israel. You're one of the leading rabbis of Israel. And you don't know what I'm talking about? He was saying that the, the, the Hebrew scriptures spoke of the new birth. They didn't use the term born again, but they did use two terms. A new heart, a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone, and a circumcised heart. So those uh, were the terms that were used in the Old Testament to speak about a new, new, new heart. And so Paul says, circumcision doesn't matter if you're not really following the Lord and in the covenant. As a matter of fact, <coughs> Gentiles who... Follow the Lord whose hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. They are the real Jews and you're not. Now, insofar as I know, I don't have any uh, a drop of blood, Jewish blood in me, or as we probably say, not a single Jewish chromosome in the gene pool. But I am a child of Abraham. Because the scriptures teach us, Paul says in Galatians that he'd already written, that all who believe are the sons of Abraham. And we are of our father Abraham as we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the second reason he gives is that dead orthodoxy is not only fatal, it's deceptive. It lulls you into sleep. It gives you a false assurance. You, you, because you go, you hold to correct theology, or because you, you participate in certain religious rites, for them a circumcision and Passover, for us it's baptism and communion, because you participate in these rites, or because you do good works, you, you get the idea that because I do these things, that I'm right with God. And Paul says, no, that's, that's a deception. Uh, he anticipates four objections to the assertion that Jews and Gentiles who trust in Christ have an equal standing with God. Because when he said this to the Pharisees especially, that Gentiles who trust in Christ have an equal standing with God for the Jews who trust in Christ because in the Messiah all the promises of God are yes and amen. That, that was just astounding to them. So they would naturally object. Uh, one objection is that this undermines, that such a view undermines God's covenant with Israel. Because the rabbis taught that uh, circumcision was sort of like a charm that would protect you against the judgment of God. And uh, Paul says, says, no, that is absolutely not the case. Uh, the advantage of being in the covenant community is this that you received the scriptures. You were the recipients and the custodians of scripture. And he'll deal with that more in chapters uh, 9, 10, and 11. Second objection is that uh, consider uh, if Jews and Gentiles are equal before God, it nullifies God's faithfulness. And there's a, here's where the play on word is on faith, uh, which can be the act of faith or the character, uh, characteristic of being faithful. Uh, and said, no, God... God is, is faithful. Uh, it, uh, 
and Paul uses one of the strongest negatives he can. Now, there's several negatives. I do remember this from Dr. Atkins. You could do ooh or ook, which means no. Or you could use ookie, which means no. Or you could use may. No, but if you said may genita, may uh, negative may with uh, genita and the optative mood, that means absolutely not, never ever. Or as I heard one preacher say, what a ghastly thought that is. So imagine pa Paul writing this, and here's Tertius trying to keep up with it, writing on his little wax tablet with his stylus. And then Paul gets here, and Paul gets all excited. He says, May Genita, absolutely not. No, it is absolutely not true that the grace of God nullifies uh, the faithfulness of God. Now, the, the, uh, and he also does in verse 6. Uh, the third objection is that this, this uh, equality before God maligns God's justice. But Paul says, wait a minute. God judges libertines he judges moralists he judges the self-righteous God judges everybody so nobody escapes God's judgment it is just and then the fourth objection is that this construes the glory of God and Paul says look some people misrepresent what I'm saying some people say well if if God's grace is exhibited by his forgiving us our sins, well, the best thing we can do is sin more so God's glorified more. Makes perfect sense, right? Wrong. Paul says, people who think like that, their condemnation is just. They justly deserve uh, the wrath of God. Now, every theological system has its tendencies when it goes to seed. It is not a coincidence, for example, that Pentecostalism arose out of a Wesleyan Arminian theology which emphasizes uh, decision and experience and emotion. But before we condemn those brothers and sisters, we have to think about our own tendency. The tendency among Calvinists, the Reformed folks, and Lutherans is dead orthodoxy. We think if we just get it expressed precisely and minutely, that that's all that really matters, getting it right or keeping the rules. But Paul says, no, dead orthodoxy cannot save you. Dead orthodoxy kills you. Dead orthodoxy deceives you. Only Christ can save you by his grace. All right, other questions? Yes. Is keeping kosher another one of their rules yes. today? Yes, as part of being holy. Okay. We'll see the little circle K, part A, on some foods. We yeah. have family members that left yeah. Christianity for yeah. Why why do the why do the Jews uh, not make sacrifices, animal sacrifices? Well, the answer is because they can't. Because the temple was destroyed. And uh, you have to have the temple, and you have to have a priesthood, uh, Kohen. Remember a lot of Jews named Kohen? Probably they are descendants of uh, the priestly tribe in Levi, and even in the synagogue today, uh, the owner of the ironic benediction, the Lord bless you, keep it so forth. Uh, no ordinary rabbi can do that. 
only if you are Kohen. So somebody named Kohen is the one who gives the sacrifice, uh, gives the benediction. But they cannot do that because the temple is destroyed, and, and, the, and that is one of the great griefs to them. That's why, you know, in a Jewish wedding, when they throw the wine glass down and then they stomp it, that is a reminder of the destruction of the temple. So that the happiest day of the life of getting married is also a bittersweet day that reminds me of the temple has been destroyed. I did ask uh, an Orthodox rabbi this once, um, well, if the temple ever were built, would you uh, try to reinstitute animal sacrifices? And he sort of was very ambivalent because he thought that wasn't very modern and very uh, civilized and, and uh, so forth. But he said, well, and then I kept pressing him. He said, well, it's, the law is the law. And if so if God said we have to do it, then we do it. But uh, the substitute now is good the works of the individual Jew. And even their own death. Remember in the Orthodox Jewish prayer book, one of the prayers that is prayed before one dies is, may my death, my death, be an atonement for all of my sins. All right? Well, my time's up, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy to us. We thank you for the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you will help us to rely upon your grace. And we know that we are Pharisees by nature and inclination and being Reformed folk. We get a double dose. Lord, deliver us from our self-righteousness and enable us to live in your grace. We 